Hello, good evening and welcome to Westmoreland Geological Society November Lecture. Tonight, uh, it's a great privilege to have with us Professor Mads Hoos from the University of Manchester. Mads is Professor of Geophysics, where he leads an active research group, has over 10 PhDs using seismic data to study the fill, paleo environments and fluid flow in sedimentary basins around the world. About half of his published work concerns the North Sea Cenozoic, with particular emphasis on glacial geology and fluid flow. He's published many papers, uh, both with his PhDs and with his postdocs, working on the glacial records in the North Sea, and they can be found online at the link that was included in the poster, which went out with the invitation. So I'd like to hand over to Mads, who's going to present his lecture, The Glaciation of the North Sea Basin. Thanks for turning out on this rainy, windy Wednesday evening. Um, it's certainly not pretty in Wales where I'm sitting. Um, so I took the background on a nicer evening. I need to figure out how to, uh, in Aarhus in, in the 1990s, in fact, I spent virtually all of the 1990s uh, doing geology out of Aarhus because I ended up doing all my degrees there with, with small breaks in, in Bangor in North Wales and, and in, in New York. Um, and when I did my PhD in Aarhus, it was meant to be on the Cenozoic fill of, of the Eastern Danish North Sea. And we had a really unpleasant surprise that half the conventional Cenozoic fill was eroded away by these enormous meltwater canyons uh, or channels uh, formed under the, the Pleistocene ice sheets. So suddenly we realized we had to study those as well. And that has stayed with me for, for the sort of 20 plus years since I finished. And uh, the story has become deeper and, and better as we got access to more data. Lots more PhD students went over the data. And, and wow. some of those are mentioned underneath the, the picture here, which, which shows some very large tunnel valleys in, in the southern North Sea Basin. And these are imaged on basin scale 3D seismic surveys. So those are surveys that are, in most cases, not acquired as a single survey. This one is knitted together by uh, PGS, which is one of the seismic uh, survey companies. And uh, they must have knitted that together from more than 200 surveys. And it covers of the order of 50,000 square kilometers across the, the Dutch and UK borders and to both, both coastlines of both countries. So we're privileged getting access to all this data and also privileged by the fact that it affords us tremendous insights in, into the shallow section of, of the North Sea, which is much better preserved than the equivalent stratigraphy onshore. And uh, that is why we think the offshore has a lot to offer to, to the understanding of the glaciation of Northwest Europe. And uh, the way I've structured the, the talk today is I will go over setting up the problem and then uh, tell you some things that you might already know. And then uh, right at the end, I will show you some of the latest things that we, we published very recently, um, which completely pulls the carpet away from the uh, many of the studies that have been doing going on onshore because it shows the, the stratigraphic record onshore is woefully incomplete. And um, that's how it's going to be. And so most of this work has been done either in Aarhus, Aberdeen or Manchester, and most recently in collaboration between Aberdeen and Manchester. So uh, first slide is uh, just See? alluding to the history of glaciation yeah. through time. Somebody needs to get. Okay. Um, and uh, what you have on the bottom is basically a, a sort of a stratigraphic time. And this is compiled by Jonathan Craig um, and published in the journal or in the Jolstock special publication, showing that we had multiple uh, ice houses through geological time. And we're currently in an ice house, although, of course, we hear a lot about. Uh, the fact that we might soon be leaving the ice house, uh, not of the sort of regular mechanism that we should be, but because we 
emitted too much carbon dioxide, but that's really a story for a different evening. Um, so through geological history, probably about a third to a quarter of, of the geological time was in such ice, ice houses. So they're not unusual, uh, nor are greenhouses. Um, they will just be very different to live in those conditions. Now, what we have up here on the top right hand corner is a stratigraphic chart going from the, uh, what is in this chart called the, the neogene, but that's actually a lot of this is now considered quaternary. So the, the lower Pleistocene from about 2.58 million years upwards is now all quaternary. And the arrows here represent um, evidence for glaciation from various scattered records. Um, whereas the, the, the sort of black contours on the South Pole represent the present day glaciation as well as the, the Pleistocene um, or maximum Pleistocene glaciation in the Northern Hemisphere. Right, so how do we do this? Yeah, okay, so zooming in on this, uh, we can see that um, in, I think there must be some way I can get rid of all these uh, faces on the right hand side, or maybe they don't appear on your screen. Uh, let me see. I think that might be better for you. There's a, okay. there's a little blue box on your face. If you click on your face, there's a little blue box. I can't see my face. <laughs> well, you should be able to see your space. Oh, in my space, yes. Yeah, well, if you hover over that, one of those allows you just to have your own box there. Okay. okay. Um, my mouse has now gone a bit funny, uh, maybe because it's a laser pointer. Uh, yeah. So I, I'm really sorry about this, but my mouse, I can't see it. Uh, Oh, there it is, okay. Hmm, seems to be either, yeah, okay, right. So I think uh, now it's at least, not, at least not covering the slide. Okay, going back to where we were, the uh, glaciation history of the Norwegian continental shelf is generally accepted to start at about 1.1 to 1.15 million years ago. Uh, represented by this blue box here. The um, screen sharing is paused. Hmm. It's all sorts happening today. So now it should work again. Okay. What's going on? Okay, so there it is. Um, offshore uh, Britain in, in the North Atlantic, it's been known for years that there are ice rafted debris um, deposited right at the beginning of the Pleistocene at, at about 2.58 million years. And those uh, ice rafted debris are, are lithologies that you find on the British Isles. So they tell a tale of onshore glaciation, which is simply not, um, manifest in the onshore geological records because of subsequent glaciations. So that's the sort of conundrum. Offshore Norway, where we have until recently had the most complete stratigraphic record of glaciation. We have glaciation from about 1.1 million years, offshore 2.58 in the, in the North Atlantic. And then uh, at about 1.2 million years, we have the mid Pleistocene transition where Many believed until recently that we, we had the precondition of uh, glaciation becoming possible because of the, the change in, in orbital cyclicity from 41,000 years duration, which was thought to be too short to accumulate vast continental scale ice sheets to 100,000 year cycles, which sort of fitted with the Norwegian record of glaciation. The British record in comparison to, to Norway uh, on shore and in the rest of the North Sea was generally considered to start about half a million years ago. And uh, this is of course a bit of a conundrum because 
unless the IRD is something else, uh, it, it shows us we're missing a huge amount of, of glacial evidence in the onshore and in the, in the North Sea Basin. So that's what we're going to try and uh, rectify today. In my uh, own PhD work, which was published uh, back in, in 2000, uh, I, I compiled all the evidence for glacial meltwater channels in, in Northwest Europe and, and in, in Poland. Um, and I colored it by age. So we have Wyxelian in blue, Salian in green, and Elsterian, which is also called the Anglian in, in, in Britain, uh, in red. And you can see many times ac across national boundaries, we get changes in ages, which is probably not realistic. It simply reflects that there's a huge uncertainty in dating these things, but also that people work with different models, whether they have onshore or off offshore evidence or where the legacy of geological models have been carried from. Uh, and some of them are on, of uncertain age, including many onshore Denmark and the Eastern North Sea and so on. This has been completely superseded recently in a paper published this year, uh, led by Margaret Stewart and Doug Otterson of the British and the Norwegian Geological Surveys, where, where they remapped the, the Northern North Sea, but again, focusing on these uh, more recent uh, glacial uh, valleys. And, and this uh, pink phenomena here is the Norwegian Channel, which is uh, the deepest uh, part of the North Sea down to 750 meters uh, south of Norway. Uh, and emitting huge amounts of sediment on the North Sea fan during the various glaciations. And that is the feature that is generally thought to be 1.1 million years old. Right, so there we have it. We, we have the Norwegian Channel in pink, we have the Elsterian glaciation in red, Salian glaciations in green, and the Waxelian in blue indicated on the stratigraphic chart here. What I will show you today is some evidence for some of these earlier glaciations evidence for, for grounded glaciation at 1.8 million years and then uh, but before that I will show you some of the more conventional records that, that people have been comfortable with for many many years just in case you're uncomfortable going straight for the radical reinterpretation and, and some of the the data that we've used are these mega surveys these red areas are continuous 3d seismic data which occupy much of the central North Sea space and also exist all across the, the southern gas basin. In fact, uh, half of Holland is covered by similarly uh, good quality uh, 3D seismic. So there's even more we could do with that data if we were able to splice that together. So uh, setting up the, the scene for the glaciation of the North Sea basin, these are paleogeographic maps. In dark blue, we have uh, deep water conditions. In, in sort of middle blue, we have outer shelf conditions. And then we have the sort of near shore environment in the light blue uh, colors. And we're starting in the Paleocene, going into the Eocene, the Oligocene, the uh, early Miocene, mid Miocene. So there's a uh, large delta system starting to fill in the, the southern North Sea Basin, where there was previously an embayment. A lot of the fossil whales uh, in the Danish clay pits were deposited at this time in the sort of early middle Miocene where they stranded on the southeastern shores of the North Sea. Um, you can see there's still a good open connection to the North Atlantic there. So come the mid Miocene, the Baltic River system turns on and we very rapidly start filling in the reminder of the North Sea Basin. It becomes very narrow and at about this time, although it says late Pliocene on this slide, the late Pliocene, when I was a PhD student, was until 1.8 million years ago. Now the Pliocene stops at 2.58 million years. So this is actually the early Pleistocene template for, for glaciation to happen in, in Northwest Europe. So you can see there's still a deep water basin in the middle, but quite a narrowing uh, waterway to the north and somewhat enigmatic connection through the uh, Fleur Marge or the English Channel here to the south, uh, which we won't really talk about today. And then uh, come the late Pleistocene, the North Sea Basin is filled in and, and there's just a shallow water basin here, uh, which of course becomes transgressed in interglacial periods. So that's uh, the potted history of the Cenozoic in the North Sea. Um, and that's just where the paleogeographic maps belong. So this is the beginning of the Pleistocene and this is the end of the Pleistocene. 
Now, the sort of data that uh, we had available for, for PhDs uh, at the University of Manchester is uh, vastly superior in data quality and, and in abundance from what anybody previously had available. So, so we had one PhD student called Rachel Lamb working the Southern North Sea Mega Survey. Oh, sorry, that was Rachel Harding working the Southern North Sea Mega Survey. And then the year after Rachel Lamb started working the Central North Sea Mega Survey, which is even slightly bigger yet. Um, so we had two Rachels working this data in synergy and the meeting around the uh, confluence of all the sector boundaries, where there's a little um, overlap of the two data sets. And uh, what you see here is these black outlines are 3D data, the, the white lines are 2D seismic data from TGS, the, black, the 3D surveys were from PGS. Um, and most critically, you see the, this uh, description or this name here, A1503 is a Dutch exploration well, which was uh, treated to very uh, high quality analysis of magnetostratigraphy, all the sort of microfossils that you can analyze uh, and published by, by Geisa Kuhlman um, back in 2008. And the whole cornerstone of unlocking the North Sea stratigraphy in the Pleistocene is this well here and the Josephine well in the British sector. Just two uh, data points for chronostratigraphic dating. And we could then provide all the seismic uh, timelines from the, the various uh, mapping that the two Rachels did and uh, come up with a complete infill history of the North Sea Basin based on, on those calibration points. Before we get so far, I want to show you what the data look like. And uh, in this sort of scale of zooming in, zooming out, uh, what is important to, to note here is uh, that this is 75 times vertical exaggeration. So imagine that looking at the landscape at 75 times vertical exaggeration, anything would become a mountain. So what you have here are basically very, very gentle clinoforms, dipping one to three degrees, generally to, to the north, northwest. So you have the south, southeast on the right hand side, the north, northwest on the left hand side. And you're looking at a line from where it says X here to where it says X dash or X prime up here at the, at the top there. So that is effectively about 550 kilometers long. Now, what, what we observe here is that we have some ages uh, from the A1503 well, annotated 2.58 million years, 2.35, 1.94, 1.1 million years. So the pink surface is where the Norwegians have recognized for, for decades that they had their first glacial evidence. Um, these are all quite good dates and you can see there's quite a lot of stratigraphy, quite a lot of section between those two dates and they're only 0.23 million years apart. So we actually get very almost suborbital scale resolution when we, we take this apart using the seismic reflection data, um, which was very encouraging to, to realize when we put those dates on. So this here is the uh, first base quaternary surface of the North Sea in depth, um, based on all the modern 3D seismic and 2D seismic and, and well data. And uh, th this sort of supplements uh, previous versions of the same map, which were based on uh, largely Krieg borehole data and, and had quite a different shape. And uh, what you see here is that there are some sub basins, but it's largely a sort of very linear basin superimposed on, on the previous graben structure with some modifications of the, the uh, late Cenozoic uh, clinoforms filling in the basin. Uh, mainly from, from the east. And then you see this sort of narrow uh, seaway, which, which actually was, was shallow, but it was connected to the North Atlantic throughout most of the infill history of this basin. Uh, so the basin goes down to about 1200 meters depth in, in, along the axis here. 
And, the, and this is the current depth under all the sediment loads. So the paleogeographic reconstruction used uh, sort of standard decompaction techniques to, to estimate what the paleogeography would look like. But before that, I wanted to show you the infill geometries. So these are different stratigraphic packages. This is just a, a 230,000 year duration package at the very beginning of the Pleistocene uh, and the infill geometry is given by the thickness map here. You've got the scale bar here, so up to about 500 meters uh, thickness, filling this in, prograding to, to, the, uh, to the north, northwest and, and, to, and to the northwest. The, uh, a similar sort of a thickness, uh, again, in the next package, up to 1.94 million years. And then you have a quite a longer duration uh, interval mapped here because we, we didn't have quite so fine biostratigraphy in, in this interval between 1.94 and 1.09. Uh, and that goes up to about 700 meters thickness here. And that had almost filled in the entire basin, apart from this little slither uh, in, in the uh, sort of outer Moray Firth uh, area of the, of the, mainly with the British North Sea. So, so that's the sort of infill history of, of, of the Quaternary North Sea Basin. First, we get these quite localized uh, infill slithers, then a sort of broad sag, and then the very end um, on, the, on the last map. Uh, and this is a sort of paleogeographic reconstruction based on backstripping of the base quaternary surface. And uh, this was done by Rachel Lamb, and we published that uh, two years ago in, in the Journal of the Geological Society of London. And uh, we, we get water depths up to about 300 meters in, in the central North Sea. And you can see Rachel has drawn in some ice sheets already here on, on Scotland and on southern Norway. And this is at 2.58 million years, despite the onshore stratigraphers consistently struggling to find such old ice sheet evidence in the onshore record. And what is important here is also this Baltic River system feeding a giant uh, shelf delta system. You can see that the delta front is something like 200 kilometers across and the delta cone at least 100 kilometers be before we reach the sort of Baltic River system. So that's a huge delta system, which was largely the PhD of, of Rachel Harding to, to map uh, and also the, the sort of infill in the southern part of the basin. And that system basically kept pumping sediment into the North Sea, and that's why it got filled so quickly in, in the Quaternary, uh, the onset of this system, as well as the rhine Mosa system from the Southeast. Now I can see that uh, Judith still has her camera on. So uh, if, if you want to be on YouTube, you can keep it on, but otherwise you, you might want to turn it off. The uh, glacial environment that we have to think about is um, one that, that involves thick grounded ice sheets, ice shelves, uh, and uh, most spectacularly uh, in, in a lot of the stratigraphy I'll be talking about towards the end is uh, icebergs. And, and these, of course, can make drop stones as they did in the North Atlantic province or the IRD that were dated to the beginning of the Pleistocene were basically deposited in, in in laminated uh, deep water deposits. So every time you get a drop stone, you know exactly how old it is from the age of the foraminifera and, and the surrounding mudstones. Uh, in the North Sea, they're mainly prevalent by scouring the, the shelf strata, whereas the, the grounded ice leaves much more of a scour mark akin to a, a cat clawing a, at, a, at a sofa or, or at your door these sort of really heavy scour marks, which are telltale signs of grounded glaciation. And uh, the other thing we have to be aware of is the meltwater within ice sheets. And of course, in temperate ice sheets, like the one in, in the North Sea Basin, you have a huge amount of meltwater forming as the ice sheet moves from the high mountains into the lowlands, retreats and comes back and retreats. Uh, so there's huge uh, energy in the meltwater system in, in these sorts of ice sheets. And finally, the, the last process I wanted to mention is what happens as the ice is sitting on the sediment and basically leaning heavily on it, the sediment will be deformed tectonically in sort of thin slithers of, of some 100 to 300 meters thickness that thrust upon each other and, and they're telltale signs that, that we had grounded glaciation. 
Okay, so uh, what can we see that relate to glacial uh, glaciation? What can we see in seismic data? Well, we can see large scale clinoforms, which of course they don't say I'm a glacial clinoform. We have to look for other evidence to verify that that's the case. Cross shelf troughs, largely uh, sort of outer shelf uh, over deepenings, uh, which often terminate in, in, in uh, trough mouth fans, which are telltale signs of ground glaciation and, and shelf margin gla glaciation. Megascale glacial lineations will occupy these uh, a lot of the time. Then we have subglacial meltwater conduits that are tunnel valleys that could be hundreds of meters deep, kilometers wide, hundreds kilometers long. Uh, Proglacial pro channels and fans can be tricky to see with seismic data because they're often quite, uh, quite thin. Iceberg scours readily detectable in, in 3D seismic data. Glacial tectonics the same, although the origin has previously been misinterpreted. Moraines, we, we cannot sometimes see those too. Okay, and these can have different uh, scales. I, I won't bore you with this one. Uh, this figure is published in, in 2012 if you want to acquaint yourself with the sizes of, of glacial features. Okay, so the first of, of our sort of seismic geomorphological examples is, is just a, a, I wouldn't say a random time slice, but it's just a time slice from the Norwegian North Sea, just north of the Norwegian Danish sector boundary. Uh, and this is from the uh, earliest uh, Pleistocene. Uh, and you see the, the orange to sort of grayish colors are the amplitudes of the seismic reflection. Whereas the sort of uh, scratches in that seismic reflection are, are the uh, hallmarks of, of iceberg, um, grounded icebergs scratching the, the seafloor in this part of the North Sea. And you can kind of see lots of different directions. So this looks like it was just quite heavily occupied with icebergs and they were going in all sorts of directions. Whereas perhaps there's a more of a tendency to have a more unidirectional set of iceberg scours up here in the slightly further up to location. For a long time, we didn't know the age of this. We could just say, well, that looks like there's some glaciation along the fringes of the North Sea Basin before we got into the ground of glaciation. Above this surface is where the tunnel valleys occur. I then had a MSc student uh, working with me uh, at the University of Manchester in the uh, Southern British, uh, the Southern Dutch sector of the North Sea. Where, which was where we first got our eye open for the uh, good quality calibration of the stratigraphy provided by the Dutch A1503 well. And uh, here we see a, a 3D survey from the shelf region, heavily iceberg scoured with some shallow gas uh, reservoirs indicated in there. Um, and, and that sort of shelf area comes to a shelf break in, in about this position in here. And then we get some sediment wave uh, forms here with, with some bright amplitudes, possibly meaning they're gas charged uh, features. They could, we interpreted them at the time as contrarite mounds, but they might equally be sort of um, siliciclastic sort of anti-dunes formed by, by quite sustained outflow of, of sediment at the time. But these are, are generally characterized by, by far less iceberg scours. So the iceberg scours mainly occupy the, the shelf area. Uh, and this sort of shelf break is, is given by the, on the paleogeographic map at the bottom there. Right, so right at the other end of the North Sea, right at the uh, northern uh, extremity of, of, of the North Sea basin, um, a, a while back, uh, Statoil found a, a giant gas field hosted in, in Pleistocene uh, glacial deposits. Uh, and uh, this is actually a deposit that extends for 200 square kilometers and, and contains 1 trillion cubic feet of gas hosted in glacial outwash uh, deposits. It's only 160 meters below the seafloor. So I, I believe it has proven completely impossible to, to do anything with, because as soon as you start messing with the reservoir and start setting completions, the whole thing could disintegrate, of course all sorts of disasters. Uh, this was uh, published on in, in GUX Pro back in 2005, where this uh, image is from. But a very interesting uh, occurrence of a, a sort of outwash type deposit inside a cross shelf trough. 
Um, so, so that is something uh, that should be looked at in more detail. Right, so, so that feature is sitting on the surface that was thought to be 1.1 million years old in Norway. Uh, and that brings me back to, to this uh, conundrum that in, in Norway, they've understood for a number of years that their shelf glaciation started at 1.1 million years, whereas in the UK, the Dutch, the German and the Danish sector, there was a widespread dogma held that the first glaciation was at 0.44 million years. And of course, that strictly can't work very well. If you have an ice stream in Norway at 1.1 million years, you must have an ice sheet in the other sectors of the North Sea confining that ice stream to, to actually make it physically happen. So uh, there's a conundrum right, right there, and that's been known about for, for years, and, and people have scratched their heads and not quite knowing what's going on. So before we solve that mystery, I just wanted to share with you some of the, the wonderful uh, insights from high resolution data uh, from the Danish North Sea. And this seismic section in here is from the, the very southern part of the Danish North Sea, just north of the German border, where the stratigraphy is really quite, well, it's nice. It's, it's sort of prograding uh, outer shelf strata, so sort of the distal ends of a, of a delta system that was seen on shore. But then as you get up to the mid Miocene on conformity, some interesting things start appearing. And it looks like the whole thing has been tectonized. And, and you can see it's been sort of folded, but also disrupted. And you have actually forming thrust structures in the stratigraphy, but only in the top uh, 300 milliseconds, which is about 275 meters in this area. So that was puzzling. And then some of them are cut by these quaternary valleys, which are generally thought to be quaternary meltwater channels. Um, so it didn't take as long to realize that these were probably uh, glacial, uh, glacial tectonic thrust structures. And when you look at the section at one-to-one -one scale, we, we tend to look at seismic sections vertically exaggerated to enhance the detail that we can see. If we look at it at one-to-one, you can see that the thrust planes are about 30 degrees, which is perfect for, for thrusts in unconsolidated materials. And uh, all those glacial tectonic complexes, we map them out uh, in these yellow uh, patches, and you can see the direction of thrusting inferred from the transport direction. Uh, this is all based on 2D seismic data, I should say, so the tunnel valleys look a bit smoother, a bit more sort of continuous perhaps than, than what we see in 3D seismic data, which I'll show later on. You can also see those big holes in the data where we couldn't actually map them quite together. In comes uh, PhD students gifted with 3D seismic data. And in this case, uh, Thijs Anderson, who did his PhD at Aarhus, also had access to transient electromagnetic data from onshore uh, Denmark, which has basically been mapped continuously because Virtually all of Denmark is underlain by aquifers that, that uh, provide clean drinking water, and in some cases, unfortunately, contaminated drinking water to, to consumers in, uh, in Denmark. So, so basically using helicopter transient electromagnetics, they've acquired data that are of a fidelity almost equivalent to 3D seismic data offshore. So these red signatures on here are basically the tunnel valleys, uh, onshore, which are far better known from these electromagnetic data and, and 2D seismic data uh, and boreholes than from 3D seismic. Uh, Thais had access to three 3D surveys offshore, these little faint red outlines, and you can see the grid that we had of 2D seismic data in the uh, thin black lines there. So uh, he was able to map the tunnel valleys in much more detail. And you can see cross-cutting relationships and, and tall vagues, which show undulating characteristics, which are the hallmarks of, of subglacial uh, meltwater features because they, they were eroded during oscillating and probably quite a, a protracted period of, of wastage of the ice sheet and, and melt back of the ice sheet. So, so a valley like this, we don't really know how long they take took to form, but it is possible that we can use the distance between these orbit deepenings to tell us something about that. Uh, and, and there are currently people like James Kirkham at, um, at Bass are currently looking at putting process models into understanding these things. Uh, and this is just uh, 
equivalent to a time slice, but onshore from the electromagnetic data. It's a time slice of, of or a slice of resistivity, uh, and the tunnel valleys are the highly resistive, resistive features shown in blue. Uh, and these are really quite comparable to, to the uh, 3D seismic time slices that we see offshore. So really quite a, a neat tool for, for mapping uh, Quaternary stratigraphy, where, where you have a resistivity contrast between the, the infill with fresh water uh, and the uh, surrounding claystones. And with this data, you can also see the contaminated uh, groundwater because it starts lighting up as, as less and less resistive. Right, and uh, just to say that you can also look at uh, glacial outwash channels and, and meltwater channels back in the Ordovician in North Africa, where uh, Shuyang Moreau who worked with us on, on the Southern North Sea Delta, uh, mapped this uh, beautiful outwash fan using 3D seismic from North Africa, which is uh, really quite astounding considering the, the very high velocities and the ancient heritage of these uh, Ordovician channels. So really uh, amazing uh, how far back in time one can use 3D seismic to, to unravel what's been going on. Right, so glacial valleys uh, also exist in the Carboniferous in, in places like Colombia. I won't dwell on this because I can see time is already uh, running. Now, coming back to the North Sea, uh, this is uh, work by one of my earlier PhD students, Thomas Christensen from uh, 2007. So he, he mapped a, a series of, of, of tunnel valleys in a single 3D survey. So you can see them cross-cutting and you can see that they extend down to about 400 milliseconds. And uh, you can see them in time slice. There's a survey imprint, but you can see quite nicely the extent of, of the valley in the slice there. The seismic profile along the axis is uh, not the prettiest that you'll ever see, but if you can ignore the noise, you can kind of see these slanted reflections uh, in the infill, the, the base of the tunnel valley is down here. And uh, basically the last of these infilling uh, slanted reflections, the last of the clinoforms we call them, um, has been uh, tagged by, by boreholes in, in this area and these are largely sandy clinoforms, whereas the onlap fills are much more muddy. And that's shown here with the Sophie well on, uh, on the right, on the seismic section is actually on the left, uh, on the well section over here. So that's got 50 meters of sand at the bottom, whereas the uh, Nolder well in the middle of the seismic section only has a very thin slither of sand right at the bottom of the tunnel valley. And uh, Thomas took, was quite a diligent uh, student um, and did some measurements on these uh, clinoforms and found that uh, the large, about, uh, I guess you'd say about 80% of them were dipping up valley. So they're dipping from the south to the north. And anybody who's familiar with the Danish North Sea knows that Norway is to the north of it. Uh, and before this, we, we would have thought that any clinoforms filling the valleys would have been deposited from Norway into the free space in the valley but actually the, the clinoforms are deposited from the south, filling in the valley towards the north. So that was a big conundrum. Uh, there were some down valley dip in clinoforms, but only about 20% of them. So uh, with the help of uh, Jan Piotrowski, who's a glacial process uh, expert in, in the University of Aarhus, uh, Thomas came up with the idea that, well, if you have a big ice sheet that sits on top of the landscape and it's, it's um, basically melting and, and you've got all this melt water coming up, highly pressurized, very cold. And if it comes up a sufficiently steep ramp here, it will actually freeze and potentially freeze sediment onto the base of the ice sheet. Uh, and that might allow the debris carried by the water to be deposited as these clinoforms. So it becomes almost like a conveyor belt process of the ice sheet, providing sediment and water that then freezes right at the the front of it, uh, and as the ice sheet retreats, the clinoforms get stacked up like this. Um, that was published in 2008 as a model, but uh, 
always had some problems with understanding how that could actually fill the valleys. And, and of course, some valleys were left unfilled, which begged the question or showed us that there also had to be exception from this model. And uh, just an example of uh, what we thought was downstream, certainly was when the valley was eroded, is this direction up here is, is actually to the south. You can see the the clinoforms represented by these uh, four inclined surfaces inside the valley, that they're all dipping to the north broadly. And this feature here is a, a cross-cutting valley uh, formed later. So uh, that uh, led to the idea of this, and, th and this was a recycled idea because uh, Daniel Prague, when he did his PhD in 95, he was a real trailblazer um, of tunnel valley studies in the North Sea, already came up with this uh, auto retreat um, model for, for the clinoforms in the tunnel valleys, which was then enhanced by Thomas by putting this process onto to it. And it basically requires a steep ascent relative to the uh, front of the ice sheet uh, angle um, in order to work. Now in comes the Southern North Sea Mega Survey and the extent of the Danish 3D survey that Thomas worked on would be one of these little tiles up here. So just this little area. Shuliang uh, Moreau came to work with me in Aberdeen and he worked from coast to coast on this enormous uh, 3D survey stitched together by, by hundreds of, of legacy 3D surveys. And this is just one variance time slice showing some of the tectonic structures in the British sector, but in the Dutch, uh, sort of Eastern British sector and in the Dutch sector, all these orange features are actually gla glacial meltwater features uh, from the Pleistocene. And you see there's different orientations of these. Now in, in cross section, the, the signature is often that these have a layered infill. The margins can be difficult to track and they almost invariably have to be tracked manually. Uh, there's a nice high amplitude valley fill in there, low valley amplitude valley fill in there. See there's some salt structures in the bottom there. So lots of things to look at. Uh, it took forever uh, and a day, or at least to best part of a year for him to map the, the base of all the tunnel valleys in the entire survey. And, and you see these lovely anabranching geometries, which were also shown by, by Daniel Prague, but although he only had a, small surveys. Now, the important bit here is seeing that you have a huge number of, of valleys and then mapping the infill structure. We could see that also in this area, about 80%, all the um, valleys highlighted in red are valleys with northward dipping clinoforms. So northward filling valleys, whereas the valleys were formed by an ice sheet coming from Norway and then extruding meltwater to the south. Uh, the blue signatures are valleys predominantly infilled towards the south. So uh, when we put this sort of a percentage of, of infill um, whether it comes from the north or from the south uh, onto a map, we, we, well, there's no data on this in the German sector. Uh, there's starting to be some data on this in the British sector, but it's pretty ambiguous. Um, in the Danish sector, 80% were dipping northward. Uh, in the Dutch sector, depending where you are, it could be between 80 and 100% is dipping northward which sort of begged the question, well, is this something to the south that could be supplying all the sediment? And what have we here? We have the Rhine Delta, uh, the, the Rhine and the Mersa, large river systems which have been in existence for most of the Pleistocene, although the offshore record of them have previously sort of eluded study. So we basically think that, that the infill of the tunnel valleys in the Southern North Sea is this record of, of the Northwest European rivers during the uh, sort of late Pleistocene. Right, so coming back to the glacial tectonics, uh, we modeled how these form in a numerical model uh, run by David uh, Eckholm back in 2005, and he showed the nucleations uh, to be dipping at 30 degrees, just like the actual thrust planes that we observe. This is again from the Eastern Danish North Sea. Now, 
We don't know exactly how old these are. Uh, they're incised by tunnel valleys, which we think are either Salian or Elsterian. So they could be Elsterian or older, but we always assume they'd be Elsterian. Moving into the Central North Sea, uh, this is actually the Outer Moray Firth, uh, just south of the Alba field, if anybody knows where that is. Uh, a time slice in, at 475 milliseconds shows these linear features, and I'll just zoom in on them, um, which were quite puzzling until you start looking at a cross section and you see this sort of very, quite a thin layer of heavily disturbed stratigraphy. <laughs> And uh, of course you can interpret this in different ways, but having seen the Danish uh, seismic, we interpret this as, as glacial tectonic thrust structures. Again, we didn't know how old they were. So incoming a Danish uh, PhD student visiting uh, from the University of Aarhus, uh, looking at the PGS mega survey and a CGG uh, broadband 3D seismic survey, which sort of sits within the broader 3D seismic coverage. And, and she was able to, to take this data and map it uh, at very high resolution because this new broadband 3D seismic data actually have high resolution right to the sea floor. And uh, she was able to map several surfaces, uh, one co coinciding with the Cromerian uh, complex uh, and the deeper reflection at the bottom of the Jaramillo uh, magnetostratigraphic uh, level. And the, the tunnel valleys in the area are widely thought to be Elsterian, MIS-12, about 440,000 years old. And they exist here and the glacial tectonic thrust complex is deeper, but also confined downward by this uh, Cromerian complex age coinciding with MIS-19. Uh, so we think we've found the offshore equivalent of the Cromerian glaciation, which pretty much doesn't have much of a record on shore the UK. And uh, what that looks like in seismic data, it basically looks like a harmonica. You've taken the stratigraphy and you just squashed it up like this. Um, whether it's done by push or simply by gravity uh, spreading and contraction in front of the ice, uh, we're still puzzled about, but uh, this sort of concertina complex can really only be formed in this sort of flat lying stratigraphy by a, a glacial tectonic uh, movement. So, so that was uh, the earliest, when that was done, that was the earliest evidence for, for offshore glaciation. And uh, given the directions of thrusting, that suggests the Scandinavian ice was transgressing the British sector and, and, and pushing on, on the stratigraphy in the North Sea. And of course, that's not particularly crazy because we know slightly later on in the glacial history, we have erratics uh, in Norfolk coming from the Oslo Fjord area. So we know the Scandinavian ice uh, sometimes got all the way to the UK. Of course, it could also be coming by iceberg uh, as, as a transport mechanism, but let's leave that for a different discussion. Now, uh, in comes uh, some of this uh, new data or rather when we integrate all the the regional 3d seismic years of phd students work rachel harding rachel lamb andrew newton and and others working out of aberdeen uh, and this was all synthesized by bryce ray in our sort of basin wide collaboration we basically took the well this is all related to the oxygen isotope record but you have the ages and millions of years here so the uh, Original perceived wisdom was the first evidence for glaciation in the Danish, the Dutch, the British uh, sector was at this point here, 0.44 million years ago at the Anglian or Elsterian glaciation. Now I will show you evidence that we had iceberg scours predating 2.5 million years, just at the beginning of the Pleistocene, and then for almost every single oxygen isotope low, in the uh, in the Pleistocene until 1.87 million years ago when an ice sheet actually enters, a grounded ice sheet enters the central North Sea up here in the uh, Outer Moray Firth. 
So the collaboration was basically the geophysical records mapped in Manchester integrated with the stratigraphic record um, deduced in Aberdeen. And we put all that together to, to remap the glacial history of Northwest Europe as represented by the stratigraphy in the North Sea Basin. And uh, this was done using uh, the best quality seismic data we could get our hands on and a technology called uh, PaleoScan, which basically does a, a semi-automated interpretation of every single reflection in the seismic data. That doesn't have, mean that you haven't got to do anything yourself as an interpreter, you provide uh, constraints, but this software allows us to look at every single reflection over hundreds of thousands of square kilometers, potentially. And that allowed us to, to uh, map out surfaces with uh, iceberg scours and, and all these uh, red surfaces basically have iceberg scours on them. And, and the one I'm showing in here in the, in the horizon slice on the right hand side is basically a map of corresponding with the yellow dotted uh, line there. And we know from the Dutch borehole that that's 1.94 million years old. And if we zoom in on that, we can see quite long scours, uh, typically sort of five to 10 kilometers. They can even change direction. Uh, they can be curved. Sometimes you get McDonald's M's type structures. And also, I mean, this is sort of crisscrossed, I would say, although there tends to be a sort of maybe a north northwesterly uh, preferred orientation. It is to some extent random. Now, what excited pe some people much more was the uh, evidence for glaciations scouring the stratigraphy in a different way. And in this case, the lineation seen in, uh, in the horizon maps. Oops, sorry. That's a very strange. Oh, that just goes away straight away. OK, so but you can probably see hints that the, there's a uh, northeast southwest orientation in here, and, and that's the shown in the rose diagram in there. Um, and these are much more unidirectional. They're broader, they're deep, deeper than the iceberg scours. And these are thought to be mega scale glacial lineations based on a comparison between this study uh, histogram data. Uh, shown in brown here, uh, and a review of megascale glacial lineations by Matteo Spagnolo, who's also involved in this work. Um, so basically showing that we had comparable length and, and, uh, and sort of distribution to, to a standard set of megascale glacial lineations. And uh, so that is in the Outermore Firth, uh, and, and this is actually a, in the Aviad uh, gas field two cores were, were taken, which coincided with the, the sort of central confluence of, of, of these uh, scour marks. And you can see here that scour marks were mapped and dated at, at really quite high resolution from 1.87 million years uh, up to 0.9 million years. So not separated by very much, but by enough to allow us to, to tell that these were different horizons. And uh, some of the stratigraphy was exquisitely imaged by, by the Aviad core described by Bryce Ray. And um, basically, this is a, a, a grounded glacial deposit right in the middle of the Central North Sea at 1.87 million years. So, so that put to bed the, the story of, of when did ice first enter the, the North Sea in a grounded sense. Well, that is right here. Uh, and the Aviad core was very well placed to, to document that because it was right in the middle of the confluence as far as we can map it. Now, I've shown you a lot of seismic geomorphology. I've not dwelled so much on the well calibrations. Um, so here's just uh, one slide to uh, give you a word of caution that you shouldn't always believe your eyes uh, or certainly not believe people who just talk about seismic geomorphology. What we have on the left-hand side is a, is a bathymetric image of an ice stream published by Canal et al. In, in geology. And given its Antarctic location and it's on the seabed, it's highly believable that this is an ice stream scour, although it fans at the, at the, at the end here. Now, we saw something very similar in the Outer Moray Firth. And of course, we knew Scotland had been glaciated and so on. Um, 
So this was presented on a poster at the Geological Society uh, back in 2010 uh, as a potential ice stream scour in the Moray Firth. In comes the seismic stratigraphy and also the well calibration. And that is indeed late Pleistocene. But this feature here was Paleocene, at which time there was uh, crocodiles swimming around the North Sea. It was, it was subtropical, so highly unlikely to, to have had an ice stream at the time. And we've now actually figured out what was going on here is a giant landslide in the chalk surface that, that gave a seismic geomorphological expression akin to a, a totally different phenomenon in the uh, glacial stratigraphy. So beware of seismic geomorphology without calibration. Of course, everything else I showed you was to a large extent calibrated, as is this now, but showing it's not glacial. So coming to the conclusions, the stratigraphic record of Northwest European glaciation is complex uh, and many issues are unresolved, particularly onshore, uh, where decades if not centuries of, of landscape uh, studies, borehole studies, and 2D seismic studies have been carried out. And that's simply because to preserve the stratigraphy, you need a sink where, where the stratigraphy is constantly laid down and not fully eroded by, by subsequent glaciations. So in comes these coast-to-coast -coast, uh, 3D mega survey seismic uh, surveys, which are now available. Southern North Sea and Central North Sea surveys were provided up PGS, and we're currently working on a modern purpose, or what should we say, acquired in a WANA uh, mega scale 3D survey in the North Viking Graben provided by CDG. Um, these, the horizontal imaging and the stratal slicing provides detail that is actually much less, much, much more detailed than the conventional seismic resolution. The iceberg scours are found, found over the entire North Sea on the outer shelf uh, part and in the upper slope part, uh, and they allow us to reconstruct uh, paleogeographies and they're found since the earliest Pleistocene. And, and we know that that has to uh, mean there was fluctuating ice cover on land throughout much of this time and that the ice got to sea level because otherwise the icebergs could not enter the North Sea. Uh, we did some glacier, uh, some oceanographic modeling to show that the icebergs uh, scouring the sort of North Atlantic probably came out of the North Sea rather than being subbed into the North Sea, which is published in that Science Advances paper. Ice streaming uh, since about 1.87 million years has been detected in the central North Sea, and uh, so that's the first grounded glaciation in, in, in the North Sea. The glacial tectonics uh, generally uh, are quite late uh, and they represent probably thicker ice sheets, uh, perhaps under permafrost conditions. Um, so where the North Sea Basin was, was potentially very shallow, uh, well, there was not much in terms of water depth. Uh, most commonly these are Elsterian, but they, there's also pre-Elsterian uh, examples. Tunnel valley erosion is largely confined to the Elsterian slash Anglian and younger, although we do have a, a few candidates for, for pre elsterian tunnel valleys in, in the stratigraphic record. Um, the infill may be or, almost contemporaneous with the formation of the valley, or it may be entirely post-glacial. And we think we have evidence that the southern north, uh, rather than the northwest European rivers, filled in the, the tunnel valleys most proximal to them. So, so that's where the offshore stratigraphic record of those real systems exists today. And uh, of course, uh, the example I showed you at the end shows that we can't just do base everything on geomorphology. We have to uh, keep multiple hypotheses in mind uh, and seek well calibration wherever that uh, can be found. So I'll stop it there and thank you all for listening. Hey, hi, Mads. What a great lecture! So, oh, might be longer it, than you bargained for. Sorry. <laughs> well, it's the quality. I mean, I think you've thrown up a lot of issues there, which have probably got people thinking and 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 challenged quite a lot of uh, conventional thoughts. So, 
I'm expecting people will have some questions following that. So if you do have a question, please feel free to, to ask. Uh, if you can try and use this participants button, which gives you a, a hand to raise, I can then see you uh, want to ask a question and then raise your hand. come along. I should say so, that uh, the Virtually all the papers that have come out in the last uh, five years on, on this research are published open access and uh, I'm happy to provide the links, of course, uh, or you can look them up on, on that link that Richard alluded to in the abstract. Uh, so if you click on that link, you should be taken to an open access link, courtesy of the Research Council, which sponsored most of the PhDs doing this work. Yeah. Okay. Hello. Could I ask you a question? Yes, Certainly. please go ahead. Who could you right. introduce it's yourself? Jim, it's Jim Rose here. Oh, hello. Hello, Jim. Hello. Yeah, long time since uh, we've been in touch. Um, I've got two questions, um, a, a question and a comment. The, the question first is, how do you get the dates from those boreholes? What method has been used to provide the ages? Uh, it's a combination of, of uh, for a manifold biostratigraphy, uh, well, they, they've looked at everything in them and they've done magnetostratigraphy on, on the boreholes as well. And uh, I think they've just kept throwing more and more methods at them. Uh, but there's no I'm not a specialist direct... in that sort of dating, but uh, to my knowledge, everybody who's looked at them are quite supportive of those dates. And they fit the picture that we know about from further east in, in the German sector. So the sort of progressive younging of the Baltic river system. Okay, thank you. The second point is a comment, but uh, we've published quite a lot of work to say there was a earlier than oxygenized up stage 12, your Anglia and L steering glaciations in East Anglia. And mm. John Lee's published a lot of work to, to show that there's been a number of glaciations in the North Sea, rather the similar, as you've, uh, similar way to you've said, working with the Norwegians. So I do think that you have not fully represented the situation as it exists. Maybe it represents mainly my bias coming from the Danish side, where we were yeah. more dogmatic at, at, at the Elsterian being the beginning. So yeah. apologies if, if, and I shall no, try and okay. be more Good. fair to the East Anglian record. Yeah. Good. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, fantastic data, I must say. Really fantastic data. Thanks for the uh, comments as well. Thank you. Bye. Right, I have a, a question from Chris Wilson. If you want to go ahead, Chris. Okay, can you all hear me? I think I've unmuted, yes I have. Yep. Uh, I was wondering whether the climate modelers have anything to say about whether, you know, the earlier ice uh, glaciations that you've given evidence for, would they have just been Scandinavian or would they have been both on both sides of the North Sea? Well, the... Um... The grounded glaciation is, is the best one to go by because obviously iceberg scours are quite hard to pinpoint exactly where they come from because they're sort of almost randomly oriented. But the, uh, the megascale glacial lineations appear to come from both sides. Um, so Bryce Ray, who's more of a, a glacial expert than myself, uh, had done quite a lot of work on, on modeling the, the basal conditions of an ice sheet that would allow nucleation on, on the, mainly the Scottish mountains, I guess perhaps a little bit in the Lake District, uh, now that we're, we're in the Westmoreland Geological Society, um, and then be allowed to run out on a slippery substrate and all the way into the North Sea, because it's quite a long distance for an ice sheet that was previously thought perhaps not to have been there. Okay, thanks. But uh, yeah, climate modelers, I, I guess, are challenged enough to uh, model the last few glaciations and modeling something that happened more than a million years ago mm -hmm. is probably a, a tall order in terms of constraints. Mm -hmm. But at least we now know what the North Sea Basin looked like as a body of water during most of the history of the Quaternary, which all also wasn't so well known. Okay, hey, anybody else have a question for Mads? Yes, I have one. Or Go more. ahead. 
more of an observation, really. Um, I was just going back to that question about how you how the um, sampling was done to do your um, your chronostratigraphic um, time scale. Um, I mean, in my experience in, in in the North Sea, the drillers go through the quaternary section just as fast as they can because it's just rubbish as there as far as they're concerned. So how do you? I mean, they're going at a hell of a rate. How do you how do you get the samples um, with enough confidence, given that you're drilling it that fast, to be entirely in, sure? In the Dutch the... sector, in the north, northern part, they have several Pliocene gas fields. So, so they're very interested in, in that part of the stratigraphy, so they, they've actually okay. done a, a much better job. And, ha and how about on the Josephine? Well, because Josephine was targeting um, Jurassic, I think. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm aware that Josephine has been used by the Quaternary community for a long, long time, even when I was back in Aarhus, uh, Karen Louise Knussen was working on the forearms from the Josephine borehole. Uh, so that was in the mid nineties. So for some reason that just has a, a much better record than most of the wells. I don't know if there was some ploy to actually generate a good stratigraphic record for the quaternary yeah. on that particular well, or, or maybe it's just where it's located that it's got really good, uh, nice mudstones. Yeah, it's interesting. Like I say, I mean, normally the sample catches can't keep up in that part of the section mm. because they're just drilling it so quickly. Uh, just before I left Denmark, it, it was actually an oil company approached the university to say, well, if you want to have somebody on standby, we could let you come on the rig and sample our boreholes because we've become interested in the quaternary. Mm. But we couldn't actually, you know, it couldn't be done with safety and right. so on. But um, so sometimes the companies seem to be interested in it. Sometimes they don't give it. They just Thank want you. to do it fast. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I, I don't see any more blue hands coming up. So, I mean, I'm hoping there's more questions for you, Mads. But uh, unless people oh, come please, please don't uh, don't force them. No. Okay. <laughs> no, but you're, I'm you're... happy to take them. Obviously, but. Uh, you obviously made such a cut and dried case for it that uh, everyone mainly dry st stunned into silence. Nothing contentious, nothing to argue about. Or maybe with, I with can the... see several people are itching to ask a question, or maybe they're just itching for their supper. I don't know. Well, with all the screens switched off, maybe uh, maybe a few have fallen asleep. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, certainly. So. Uh, so any, is there anybody who would like to ask a question of Mads? Silence. In that case then, uh, I'd like to thank you Mads, but I'd also like to hand over to Audrey Brown, who is going to give a vote of thanks. Ooh, Audrey? Yes, I'm here. Oh, so that's good. <laughs> Uh, two things I think struck me. One was just how how much the uh, the data collection and the type of data has improved as time has gone by, and so that some of the modern um, data that you showed, where it's almost done automatically, is just fantastic. So I was interested to see how that happened. Um, we were lucky enough to uh, escape just before the world went mad down to Antarctica um, oh, wow. at the beginning of the year. So I've seen real icebergs, <laughs> not scouring in the seabed, I don't think, but, but at least I saw icebergs carving off glaciers in, in Antarctica and uh, whether, whether they were carving into the ground or, or whether it was all giant landslides, who knows, but, um, but I keep an eye out for anything to do with Antarctica now because I kind of feel I've been in the sea. Uh, so that was great. I, I mean, I, I'm, not, I'm not an expert. There are people here who, who looked at seismic sections all their careers, so I can't pretend to know about that, but it was really interesting. And so thank you very much for uh, giving up your time and coming 
to talk to us tonight. So thank you very much. Pleasure. Thanks for, for your patience and participation. Yeah, we can all say thanks to, to Mads with a, a round of virtual applause, perhaps. Yeah, thanks yeah. very much. Well, yeah, really thanks, did. Mads. Yeah. No, that was great. Eh? So, 